us. Okay, we are all here, I believe. Sorry about that. I got lost on the way to the party. That's okay. I think it's <laughs> it happened. It happened. Four it happened. I've got lost in different places. So. Okay, I uh, we're going to call this meeting to order. This is the two thousand and uh, excuse me, February seventeenth, two thousand twenty-one meeting of the Scarborough Main Town Council. First item is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag uh, of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number three is roll call. Tody? Councilor Clucci? Here. Councilor Gleistein? Councilor Anderson? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor Johnson? Here. Councilor Hamill? Here. And Chairman Johnson? Here. I'm here, Tody. Thank you. Item number four is general public comments. If you are in Zoom to comment on the ICE facility, we will be taking ICE facility comments after item number nine. So if you are in Zoom to discuss the ICE facility, we will be taking comments after item number nine. Are there any general public comments on anything that's not on the agenda? Mr. Deering, I'm going to allow you to speak, but your microphone needs to stay off. And you, are, you come in on mute, so you need to unmute it, please. I'll ask you to unmute, that might help. Okay, Mr. Deering, I'm going to put you back in because I believe you can, you should, your microphone is still muted. I'm going to put you back in the audience here. And if you would like to speak during the non-action item, you can. Okay, with that, item number five is the approval of the minutes of the February 3rd, 2021 Town Council meeting. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. And, nope. Any discussion? No? Cody? Councilor Coochie? Yes. Councilor Gleistein? Yes. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Councilor yes. Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes. That was unanimous. Thank you. Item number six are adjustments to the agenda. There are no adjustments to the agenda. Item number seven are treasurer's warrants. I have signed the most recent batch. And item number eight is the town manager report. Tom? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you all and, and my staff for support last week. I was out of the office uh, just knowing that all of you uh, kept doing your business here and, and I didn't have to think about it was a huge relief and I'm forever grateful for that. So thank you very much. A um, couple of quick things. Uh, just as we're moving into budget time, um, I'm very thankful for the Finance Committee was able to work through and meet its charge given to it by the council, which was to derive some further detail, uh, kind of first reading targets on budget. Um, pleased to report, and I think uh, Mr. Colucci might report further later that they met earlier this evening and, and did accomplish that. So from my perspective, everything is in place. Uh, budget depart uh, department budgets will be coming to me at the end of next week. And then I'll have the month of March, if you will, to put it all together and we're scheduled for a presentation before the council at a special meeting on March 31. And that will really kick off the process for the council to go through the detailed review, all working toward adoption uh, at the June primary. Um, ad hoc committees uh, continue to meet. Again, uh, four of you are on uh, one of these committees, so I suspect you may want to respond further. But just in terms of occupying my time, I. I am attending the large committee meetings. Uh, they're meeting both twice monthly 
luckily on opposite uh, weeks. So we're able to manage that. Uh, they both adopted kind of a subcommittee structure to work through their work. Um, I will say I get a sense that they're feeling the pressure, the timeline pressure. So uh, I guess I say this uh, really for the council members uh, liaisons to hear, perhaps we ought to relieve them at some point um, because I really think we've got quality folks that want to do quality work and I'd hate for them to feel um, under some pressure. Um, so we can talk about that in the, in the future, but very pleased with how quickly they've hit the ground and the sort of substantive work they've already undertaken. Um, with respect to the Avesta senior housing uh, project that was workshopped at your last council meeting, uh, that project uh, is moving forward for kind of further review and discussion. And I just want to make the council aware the finance committee has agreed to consider kind of the financial aspects of uh, the project uh, at its next meeting on the 24th of February. That's a four o'clock meeting. Uh, I do expect that uh, they'll act, uh, the, the applicant will actually be looking at the CA policy and seeing how uh, best they can um, work within the, the confines of that policy and appreciating that it was really designed for a slightly different purpose, but I think there's some value nonetheless. Uh, coincidentally, that same night at six, uh, they're scheduled to meet with the affordable housing uh, committee. And I believe they'll be uh, making overtures and a, if not a, a formal request, uh, should this go forward to access the initiative funds. I don't know much more than that, other than the, the fact that they're on the agenda. And as you may recall, uh, they are anxious to undertake the planning board review process. Uh, this is a lengthy process and it's, uh, it's essential for them, uh, so they say, to achieve planning board approval. Uh, so I believe that they're scheduled to appear on the next planning board agenda. And uh, in advance of that, uh, they have scheduled a neighborhood meeting uh, actually tomorrow at six. Uh, it's a virtual meeting, of course. So things are moving. Um, I guess I, I bring all that up to say, uh, let's not get over anxious about it. I appreciate that they want to keep kind of moving methodically forward uh, and we'll know more as these discussions unfold. Um, I really want to give credit to Councilor Anderson. Uh, a couple of weeks back, he made a very astute observation uh, and one that I've been knowing that we're deficient on for some time is to really come up with a, a, some way to, to routinize um, our agenda format. And um, it's an excellent point. And I think from his perspective, kind of being new to the council, some of the items, and you, in fact, you have one on your agenda tonight that spans back about six months. And if you weren't you know, part of the council or paying very close attention, uh, there's a lot of a uh, lot of background that often gets kind of glossed over, and uh, we're we're working toward a, a really instituting a routine form uh, and kind of a standard standard format for agenda items, and it will give us the opportunity to provide clear and concise recommendations, to provide uh, historical background information, and hopefully just really um, shape things up so it's a lot more readable for you and for the public as well. Um, Councillors may recall, uh, I did have a proposal in last year's budget for a, a software system that could assist in this. And I, I think I'll look at it again, uh, but you'll see something coming uh, forward this spring to help uh, move that initiative along. And I appreciate Councillor Anderson for giving me the nudge that I've needed for some time. Uh, I guess lastly, I just wanna make you aware of the annual rally to keep our neighbors warm. Um, uh, effort. Uh, this is something that Project Grace does and the town has long partnered with Project Grace. Um, we'll be hosting this event uh, at the new public safety building on Saturday, February 27th from 10 to 12. I believe there's a, a generous challenge grant uh, put out by Mr. Wooden, a, a longtime town resident, um, and we've been successful historically to meet that challenge grant uh, and I hope we can do it again this year. This event is done in coordination with the Friends of Public, the Scarborough Public Library and the Scarborough Lions Club as well. And lastly, I just wanted to mention uh, the passing of uh, former Board of Education member, Town Council member and Town Council Chair, uh, Carol Rancourt. Carol, I had the pleasure of working with uh, early in my tenure. Uh, she was really a, a, a star of, of the community uh, in all respects, uh, longtime employee of the Southern Maine Agency on Aging 
and really touched a lot of people through her civic uh, duties and through her work and, and personal uh, pursuits as well. Um, just a, a wonderful lady and uh, someone who just loved Scarborough through and through. So I just wanted to acknowledge her passing. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm uh, available for questions. Thanks, sir. Any questions for Tom? No, Tom, thank you for the update. Very informative. Thank sure. you. And thanks to the Finance Committee for looking at the, um, the, the CEA request there for um, the public safety building project, public safety building project, I should say. Okay, item number nine is a non-action item and it's going to be presented to us by uh, Councilor Anderson. Councilor Anderson, can you see, do you, can you share? Do you have sharing abilities? You do? Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, I think so, so. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so it's a report on the ICE uh, detention facility here in Scarborough. So I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Anderson. As a matter of background, uh, we have received 230 emails in regards to the ICE facility. Uh, to the best of our um, clerk's knowledge, 15 of those were res res uh, registered voters in Scarborough. Uh, nevertheless, there's uh, absolutely uh, some need for public education and um, to bring, I think, the residents of Scarborough deserve an update on what is happening. And Councilor Anderson has been gracious enough to take, uh, to take this on. So uh, you have my appreciation, John, and with that, you can move forward. Great. Thanks, Paul. Can you guys see my screen? Just make yep. sure it's working. Yeah, so as Paul said, you know, I think... It was after a, a Bangor Daily News article that was published in December that we started to get emails from residents about concerns about the ICE facility. And I, I'm embarrassed to say myself, you know, even prior to this, like that there was a lot more history there that I wasn't aware of. I think just with COVID and everything going on as a resident, like I didn't know about this. Um, and I know some other counselors have been working on this since the beginning, um, but I'm gonna share a little bit of the current facts and the information we have and the things that I've gathered over the past couple of weeks, reaching out to different people at the town, at the state, at the federal government level, just to kind of get a better sense. It's still not complete, but I think it's, it's a start to really just start to share more with the public, what we know, um, how we got here, and, and you know what's, what's the scope of the council at this point in terms of of what we have in terms of our ordinances and what we can do. So I'm just gonna walk through this and then, you know, again, open it up for questions or comments with the council. So, you know, a, a lot of people were wondering like, what's the scope of this and, and, and how did we get to this point? And I think the latest information was, this was brought forward to the planning board um, in August where, you know, this is, a, a partnership between a private developer who went and bid for the federal government to get um, you know, somebody to, to lease their property. The, the leasing agent is the General Services Administration who is the, the landlord for the federal government and acts as the agent for a lot of agencies. And when the GSA put out the, the bid, it was to support both ICE and the Portland Veterans Center. And so of the 16,000 square feet that's dedicated to that facility, about 6,000 square feet of it is going to be for ICE. And at least according to the developer at this point, you know, there's at least 12 employees that will be working there that will be dedicated to the facility. Um, still not clear, or still haven't gotten clarity in terms of like what, what's the type of mission services that are going to be delivered by that facility. Um, so I think that's still a question to, to better understand. Um, so this was brought forward to the planning board in August uh, to review their site plan. So you can actually go on YouTube and actually listen to that meeting. Um, it starts at about 53 minutes in and it's a really great conversation between the planning board and the developer to better understand the facility itself. Um, that's where you know, there's a lot of information to, to be gleaned about what, you know, what's gonna happen there as best as the developer could provide information on. Um, you know, the, 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 these planning board meetings are public meetings and, and everybody does have the opportunity to participate uh, and provide public comment. And at least at this meeting, you know, I didn't notice if any, any public participation occurred, but this is really your opportunity when, when um, you know, new developments are taking place where, where, you know, developers or people are submitting 
information and applications. Like this, this group is really the group that's reviewing those and providing the recommendations. The facility itself is going to be located on 40 Mason Libby Road in the industrial district. Um, and again, as, as everything was reviewed by the planning board, you know, they conducted the review and it met all the criteria of our zoning and, and site plan requirements. And so they ultimately um, approved this particular project. So just for those that are unfamiliar, the planning board is a quasi judicial board and they are um, part of our charter for the town town. And, you know, they really do serve as the authority for performing the reviews and making sure that these developments are, are in accordance with our, our ordinances and providing um, approval and recommendations. They are not a policy making body, so they don't consider policy as part of their review. They have very strict requirements of what they can and cannot do. Um, again, you can join their meetings and there's a public website where you can go, and, which I've, which the link is provided in the packet um, with this information in there. And you can also provide questions and comments. So if you see anything that you have a question about or concern, that's, that's another opportunity for you to get involved and engage so that it goes directly to the chair. This is a new thing that um, thanks to Ken Johnson on the council and, and the, the town staff we've started to do to make more available to the public if they wanna provide input and comments to some of the, the key uh, boards that we have. So in our current zoning for the industrial district, we do currently allow for non-municipal government offices. And so that's where this particular ICE facility is, is compliant with our current ordinance. Um, you know, what, what changes could be made? So I think there, there are a number, number of different avenues that could be pursued uh, in the future if, if the council decided we wanted to move forward with making amendments to the ordinances around around, you know, future um, facilities such as this, you know, but again, I think legally we would need to kind of do some more homework around the U.S. code and state law to make sure that, you know, whatever we do um, would, would, you know, be legally permissible. When it comes to making changes in the zoning ordinance, for those who have raised that as a question, you know, it's, it's, very well put and articulated in section two part B of our zoning ordinance, um, as well as our town and council rules and policy procedures that kind of outline what the town council can do as it relates to, to changing the ordinance. Um, you know, we've, we've received some comments about the, the resolution that was approved back in October for standing against racial and social injustice. And so, uh, just to remind folks, you know, because I think this has been one of the the key items that have come forward where a lot of people um, have concerns and see this as a moral dilemma based on, you know, ICE's treatment um, of, of immigrants. And so that's partially why we're having this discussion today to live true to that resolution and make sure when things come up, when the community identifies a need or an opportunity for us to kind of make sure we're living true to that, that um, that resolution that we we have the conversation. And so that's that's partly why we're having this item today as an agenda item. Um, the, we, we received some questions about um, Scar Scarborough Police Department and their level of cooperation with ICE in the facility. And, you know, at, at this point, it's been virtually no cooperation. I think ICE notified the police department when they decided to come here, but even looking at the past 30 years of history from a lot of our, our members at the police department, they can only identify maybe a handful of situations where there has been some sort of um, coordination with, with ICE or their predecessor in the past. And so there has not, and, and beyond providing the same services they would provide to any business, there's no intention to provide additional support at this time. We've gotten, especially in the emails that Paul referred to, a request for a moratorium um, on the building. And so again, so as long as it's meeting our existing town ordinances and the, the building inspector doesn't identify things that are you know, out of code, at this point, there's nothing we can do to pull the permit or slow the building down. Um, and I think it's, it's of note that, you know, even if we were to amend the 
the current ordinance, you know, this, this particular facility, because it met all the legal requirements up to the point that's in the law, it would it would still be grandfathered in and it would still be here. So it wouldn't it wouldn't stop the current facility from from coming in. Can we revoke the permit? So again, the town council has no authority to do that. There is a process though where people can go through the zoning board of appeals or through the planning board to the superior court. So that's an option for, for residents and individuals if they wanted to pursue that path. But at least in terms of the town council, you know, there's no specific authority we have to revoke um, permits for the facility. Will the town issue a formal statement denouncing the facility and its construction? I mean, I think at this point, it's up to each counselor to decide, you know, what if they would want to do that. Um, if we were to do a um, more formal statement, you know, that's something we would have to work through on the language on, which we have not had discussions on to do. That's something that, you know, I think was thrown out there as something that could be uh, pursued going forward. Um, again, when it comes to contacting who to contact, you know, please continue to send in your concerns to the town council, um, but also please consider also reaching out to your state and, and national representatives as well. Um, this is really, you know, at this point, it's a federal matter and, and engaging you know, your national representatives is probably the best course of action if your concern is really about ICE and immigration overall. Um, so those are kind of, those were the FAQs that we have today. Um, there has been a lot of conversation back and forth that I've been having with the GSA and ICE directly, um, trying to get a little bit more information. And as that information becomes available, I'm happy to share it with the public and make sure um, you know, you can email me uh, at my council email address if you want to get in touch and get that information. And as I have it, I'm happy to share. So with that, that those are kind of the, that's kind of what, what I've learned over the past couple of weeks, trying to dig into this a little bit more and really understand where we are, how we got here, um, and, you know, now open, open it up to the rest of the council for questions or, or comments. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Do you mind unsharing? I just can't see anybody when you're, thank you. Yep. Any questions for uh, Mr. Anderson, Councillor Katerina? Yeah, uh, thank you, John, for doing that. I just wanted to add a couple of facts to this. Um, I first learned of this facility February 14th, a year ago uh, this week. Um, that was when ICE first made its announcement that they were planning on moving what they currently have at South Portland over on Gannett Drive uh, here to Scarborough. Um, I immediately contacted um, uh, Representative Chiazzo, um, Senator Sanborn at the time, that's from the state. Um, and um, they, they, and it could have been Mr. Chiazzo, I don't remember exactly, but anyway, Shelly Pingree's office was involved. And there were a number of, um, uh, ma mail inquiries and, and questions asked of ICE uh, at that time. Of course, uh, Representative Pingree's position, and rightly so, was why would you, not just the fact it was ICE, but why in the world would you put an ICE facility attached to a, a facility that treats PTSD and veterans? Uh, so that was one of the angles that they were pursuing. Uh, March 13th, uh, and actually on February 14th, at the time that ICE announced, there was a big article in the paper about it. There was also a, a, a large article um, in March 13th in the leader regarding, this was in 2020, uh, regarding ICE facility coming here. Um, now, of course, does anybody remember what happened in the middle of March last year? Uh, it was COVID. COVID, I think, uh, kind of disrupted people's uh, attention onto this, even though I kept uh, trying to keep this in front of folks. Um, I know when I went to the planning board, it took a while for it to get the planning board. I know um, there were some members of the planning board who were doing, trying to do a slow walk on it, as we call it. Uh, and regretfully, no one showed up. That was the opportunity for people to show up and, and really make uh, their positions known. 
Uh, I do know that uh, the state legislators are continuing to, you know, look at whatever at this point. But I think the the a couple of the things that I think that are important for the public to know is is federal preemption, if you want to call it that, of of local ordinances uh, can occur. The feds sometimes can say, we don't care what your ordinances say, we want to do it anyway. Uh, and of course, they take the risk of, of protests and, you know, riling everybody up. It's not, it's not a good plan. Um, but, you know, and I do want to say, before I forget, I'm looking at some notes here that I scribbled, that um, 230 emails, it's my understanding, a number of those came from young people in the community. So bravo to you for uh, being involved in the situation. Um, so, I, you know, personally, um, I don't like having ice here. I, I just don't. I, I don't like what they do. Thankfully, we have a new uh, presidential administration and maybe we'll see some changes. Um, but um, I think the horse has left our barn, so to speak, uh, and it's really up at the state and federal levels right now if, if people want to continue. Uh, there's also something called protest that you can go and do signs and march in front as long as you're not blocking traffic or doing anything illegal. So um, that's my comment anyway. Thank you. Any, <clears throat> any others? Councilor Cucci? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, I, I, I was also encouraged to see the um, activism from a number of young uh, students, uh, both high school, I, I think, and, and college in the surrounding area, in, in, including Scarborough. I, I think that's encouraging to see um, that, that you voice uh, your opinions and, and share when you see something that you disagree with. Um, on, on this particular topic, I think we need, it's a big issue, right? Immigration is a complex beast. And um, ICE is an enforcement arm. Uh, they're your neighbors, and in many cases, your friends. Uh, you might be going to school with some of their kids, but they're part of our community, whether they have an office here or not. Um, and they're just doing their job. So I, I, I wanna make sure we don't label them um, because they're affiliated with an organization that um, has a particular job to do that, that people don't like. I, I think at the root of it though, um, and, and I hope that at some point in some level above our pay grade, um, we can start to have a conversation about immigration. And uh, the fact is, it, it's really hard to become a citizen unless you claim asylum. And th the fact that it's so difficult to come to our country um, makes it illegal for just about everybody to be here. And that's why ICE has a, an awful lot of work to do and they're expanding. And we're on a seesaw right now, right? So the last administration, you're moving towards stricter enforcement and it'll probably come back down. So it's, um, it's not as busy, but um, I, I think young people and, and the public in general sharing their, their concerns uh, uh, about how people are treated is uh, one way to help move the, that discussion forward. So thank you for bringing it to our attention and, and making us address it at our level. Thank you, Councillor Gleistein. Uh, yeah, yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity to um, address this and I definitely appreciate um, Councillor Anderson with such a thorough job of um, research and fact finding, I was, uh, you know, I learned definitely some things from his FAQ. Um, and several folks have mentioned, you know, there's been several letters um, on this topic. Um, and I did, I did kind of want to mention that um, the council had already planned this discussion before the bulk of those letters came in because we had been hearing from um, residents. I think, you know, Councilor Katarina mentioned, you know when this really started. And we've had some residents um, kind of uh, expressing interest and concern over this, you know, for a number of months. So this was um, this was planned before the bulk of those letters came in. Um, and I, I really did appreciate the passion that many expressed um, in the letters. And I was particularly drawn to the letters that expressed a desire to have no borders around the world at all. Um, because I think this is this is honesty, and I think honesty um, and a shared set of facts, like Councillor Anderson, uh, you know, put put out, is a, is a really good place to start a productive debate. Um, and this isn't the forum or time, as um, Councillor Cucci so wisely mentioned, that uh, to have a larger um, topic 
you know, dis discussion or debate on immigration, but, but maybe somebody enterprising folks out there uh, will put something together and um, I have lots of ideas and I'd be, you know, um, honored to participate. Um, you know, so, you know, I think one thing, I think everyone understands, but you know, the federal government is responsible for immigration enforcement and I'm not a lawyer, um, but you know, I'm very aware, and I'm sure many are, that the Supreme Court in Arizona, Arizona versus United States, laid out an extensive view of the United States government's authority to regulate immigration. SCOTUS majority <clears throat> defined it as broad and undoubted and opined that this authority is derived from the legislative power of Congress to establish uniform rule of naturalization, which the executive branch has wide latitude in carrying out. And they basically struck down a lot of what Arizona could do. And so I'm not letting our state reps off the hook, but um, this, this, this issue really, immigration as a whole lands firmly um, in the lap of our, uh, our federal elected representatives. Um, I think all too often um, they have had to, uh, they've kind of punted on their responsibility for that. And the executive branches, you know, including um, President Obama, who had a, a very extensive um, uh, immigration policy, especially starting around 2012, 13. Um, and uh, it involves the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agencies and others um, under uh, DHS Secretary Johnson at the time. And it's, it's quite um, enlightening to look over those um, at the time uh, they were in place. Um, and, you know, I, I won't opine too much on, you know, some of the differences between the different administrations, but um, suffice it to say, uh, the, the enforcement has largely been left up to the administration to set priorities. And so that's, that's where we are today. And uh, I appreciate Councilor Clucci's um, comments, especially that, you know, the, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement officers, you know, they have a job and um, they have a mission to do um, that they carry out based on priorities set by the administration, who's supposed to be reacting to Congress. So. I would really say that now is the time, and I'm sure a lot of people are doing this to really start uh, engaging with your Congress, your Congress folks about what you'd like to see immigration policy as, and you know um, that's going to impact you know what um, ICE does because they respond to um, the mission they're given by the administration. So again, um, I really appreciate the folks giving us the opportunity to um, talk about this. And uh, I'm sure that we'll be hearing more in the future. Thank you, uh, Council Anderson. Yeah, you know, I thank you everybody for 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 your comments and, and for, for sharing your feedback. You know, I, I still do think that there are some things within our control, maybe not specific to the ICE facility. I think the ICE facility at this point is a done deal and, and it's not going anywhere unless the federal government makes that decision. So I feel like that's that's not something we can address. But I think maybe kind of taking some of the feedback we've gotten from the community and thinking a little bit more about what I think is really what, what, what I'm hearing is that we want Scarborough to be seen as a, a welcoming community, irregardless of, of your, your immigration status. And so I think, you know, there's just a couple of things I'm thinking about that need to be explored further that, you know, I would welcome the public to, to partner with me on. Um, one is, you know, we have the current resolution that, that the previous council adopted around um, racism and, and social injustice. I think maybe there could be an amendment to that to kind of address the welcoming nature and, and the position of Scarborough on, on in, including, you know, those that even like regardless of your immigration status are also welcome to be part of this community. So I think that's one simple thing we could do or we could create our own resolution on, on, on that altogether. Um, I think we could even take that a step further uh, and follow in the footsteps of some cities like the city of Chicago that kind of took that resolution but created it into law. They have a welcoming city ordinance that again really just tries to um, you know, make it clear that the city itself won't commit to ask about immigration status, disclose that information to authorities, and most importantly, deny individual services based on their immigration status. So I think that would be going to that, that next step with that resolution. And then thirdly, I think there's still an opportunity to better explore some of the items in the FAQ 
specifically around the legality around zoning. Like Jean Marie said, there, there are state laws that might prohibit us from doing things like this or this in the future. But I think, you know, as the state and the federal government, you know, um, push things more, you know, I think as a home rule state, the towns do have a lot of authority to try and um, define, especially through our zoning, what, what types of services and, and businesses do we want to allow here? And I think further understanding that just to understand in case there are other things in the future that as a town, we don't want the state or federal government to um, do, I think is, is worth exploring and understanding. So I think, I think there are some things we can do. It's not going to stop the ICE facility, but I think, you know, kind of flipping that and really thinking about being open to um, all individuals, again, regardless of their, their citizenship status, I think is something that, you know, we should Thanks, sir. Any others? No? Okay, I'm going to now go to public comment. Uh, just to set the appropriate expectations, everybody has a three minute time limit. After public comment, we do not respond to you. Um, so I will do a dramatic pause after public comment. If a counselor would like to respond, they are free to, um, but I will not be opening it back up for discussion. Um, so with that, I will go to the public and just go ahead and raise your hand. I will bring you in. Our policy is that you need to keep your, your camera needs to be off, uh, but you are free to speak. And Miss Henry, I believe you're going to be first. And if you could just give your name and your address, please. Hi everyone, I'm Abigail Henry, a registered voter here in Scarborough at 8 Longmeadow Road. Um, to the members of the Scarborough Council, first of all, thank you so much for your service, especially during the circumstances that have been presented by COVID. Um, Councilors Anderson and Katerina, thank you in particular for responding to my email seeking information on plans for the ICE facility earlier this year. The right to be treated with dignity and the rights of fam family unity, freedom, and wellness should not be contingent on one's place of birth. For too long, immigrants living in our communities have suffered under a cloud of fear of detention or deportation. ICE's policies of arresting and detaining immigrants race, rests on historical racism and xenophobia. An agency built on hate and prejudice has no place in my town. Scarborough is a community experiencing incredible growth and development. In fact, my family selected this place to put down roots because of a sense of safety and the perception of shared values and tolerance and inclusivity. Our city cannot be in the business of immigration enforcement. I'm here to ask everyone on this call tonight to be on the right side of history and stand together against this ICE facility here in Scarborough by working through the Zoning Board of Appeals and applying pressure to our state and federal lawmakers. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to go to Mr. Green, I believe. Hi, my name is Zeb Green. My address is 12 Alder Street in Skowhegan. Um, I'm a minister with Sacred Liberation. And over the course of my ministry, I've been able to have the great privilege to work with numerous people in ICE detention facilities. And there's been so many stories of real abuse happening inside of those facilities. I think of particularly nine men from India who were on hunger strike when I was working with them. And they were protesting verbal abuse. They were protesting the constant threat of deportation that they were under. They were protesting the quality of food that they were given. They were protesting the physical abuse that they were subject to. And in their hunger strike, they went to the point of starvation enough that the court ordered them to be force fed. And that is a process where they will be physically restrained, tied to chairs, to tables, as tubes are forced into them, causing damage to their throats, causing people to choke, causing tears, causing crying, causing people to choke back on what is being shoved into them. It is a brutal and inhumane process as I've sat through the court proceedings, as lawyers argued the necessity of that, it just felt like abuse. People had to leave the room in tears just hearing the process described. 
that is what happens in ICE facility camps, that that is a reality and it is not something that anyone wants in the state of Maine, I am sure. I am very grateful that y'all are having this hearing and being able to listen to the words of the community. I heard it mentioned that ICE enforcement agents are our neighbors, but our neighbors are also the undocumented people who live under the fear of these facilities. They live under the fear of being taken in the middle of the night and torn from their families and taken from the country that they love. Remember those neighbors, remember the neighbors that you have, the friends of your children in the schools and your towns. These are also our neighbors and those neighbors need to be loved and respected. We need to, if not close this facility, which we should do, make a public statement that we do not want ICE enforcement having a facility in this town that Maine wants more. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. I'm now going to go to Representative Sophia Warren. You are on. Great, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and thank you very much to uh, Councillor Anderson. That was, I really appreciate the, the perspective. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here tonight as a community member. I'm a new member to the main house and Scarborough is also my hometown. And I love this place and the people I love most in the world live here and I'm new. Um, only 25 and I seek to understand. I want this as much as possible to be a publicly facing conversation because since I've known about it, which is a very limited period of time, you know, relative to my, um, I guess my, my time in, in office, uh, I found that there are some differences of perspective that I've seen um, in town in understanding maybe what the level of power or responsibility could be um, in this situation. So to me, for one, I want to say that this is so far from a zoning or real estate issue as those who um, have spoken to me uh, privately that have been involved um, in the course of this process have, I think, uh, made implication to. I, I want to say even in this conversation so far, when you bring a federal agency or allow a federal agency into your town, you take on a lot of responsibility. So of course, you would hear from people outside of Scarborough. Most of those that are going to be affected by this are going to be outside of Scarborough. And one thing I'd say as well is undocumented people are need to be a part of these types of conversations. And they, of course, would not be registered Scarborough voters for obvious reasons. So I just, to me, that that framing in this is in this conversation, I think, is is very confusing and. Um, I, I guess I seek to understand it better, which is why I wanted to come here and, and listen and ask questions um, in part in having greater transparency. I, there's a couple things I wanted to bring up from a Portland Press Herald uh, issued FOIA request last year. Um, there's This is publicly available reporting, but I wanna make sure that it's um, mutually understood here that officials from the Veterans Health Center that this allotment is going to be shared with um, have express concerns about the location and, and impact of this ICE facility to their center, including, um, and I quote, uh, I'm very eager to re relocate, as you know, uh, that center Mr. Trott wrote to Alicia Woodford, an employee of the US General Services Administration. However, it needs to be the right location. And in my opinion, that is not this site. Many of the vet center clients are veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I'm concerned about more generally the accountability and transparency of the organization ICE. And I wanna make sure it's mutually understood that in a shocking report from under two weeks ago, ICE defied President Joe Biden's deportation guidelines and deported 72 people to Haiti, including 20 young children and babies. I wanna understand, I wanna make sure that it's mutually understood that in these independently run centers and detention facilities, we are we will have people coming in and out of my hometown, potentially part of separating children from their families and um, issues around a credibly alleged and proven forced hysterectomies and sterilizations of detained immigrants in their care. This is an organization more broadly that is over 1,200 reported sexual abuses almost 100, uh, 1,500 wrongful detainments between 2012 and 2018, and having separated thousands and deported um, parents from their children indefinitely without accountability more broadly. 
I think that if we're going to talk about what's happening here in Scarborough, I want to make sure it's more broadly understood. What is the history of Portland's response to an ICE facility contract in the last year? And I want to understand what, what is publicly accessible and to be known about whether this facility is COVID safe or is potentially endangering communities or exacerbating um, the spread in this time of pandemic. So I just think that the work of this council is to educate the public. And if the public here in my hometown didn't know about it, if I didn't know about it, to be frank, I think that is the responsibility of our town council to help to educate us. And that is what I wanted to do here. That is what I want to do here. So questions about public safety and about what this means for our community. And if there's nothing we can do, I want us all here in Scarborough to be aware of that and to be aware of what could begin to happen here in Scarborough at some point soon. I believe strongly that our Scarborough community deserves publicly facing conversation and transparency to deal with what I firmly believe are legitimate questions about the agency's responsibility and, res and how they respond to systemic human rights violations that have been, they've been incredibly accused of or has been proven uh, to have taken place over the course of years. Again, most recently in the, under the last two weeks um, and that that is going to be taking up residence in our state, in our town, in the many ways that I'm talking to a group of leaders of Scarborough, I'm not interested in Scarborough being known for that reason. These are some of my concerns. I appreciate what you've had to share with me. In certain ways, I feel still quite concerned. This is a home rule state. I think you have a lot of power here, certain power that I think is not fully realized. And certainly I've not seen it be exercised. If you mention that the planning board approved this measure, am I to understand that you did not bring this to the full council? Um, I'm wondering if there were calls for transparency, what did you ultimately find out over the course of this last year? What do you still not know? And in my opinion, in part, if I could be frank, more broadly speaking, discussing changes to ordinances or um, zoning regulation is part of your work and is part of your responsibility. So even to have a serious conversation about that I'm just wondering what is the shared knowledge around ICE here in our town and between us here in this conversation. And then um, I guess to understand what would you be willing to do? What would you not be willing to do? Or what is truly out of your hands and what do you actually in this situation have the power to do? And you're also, you're a council in the last couple of years who has a history of doing what they think has been right for the town, risk being sued settling lawsuits for upwards of $1.4 million in property taxpayer money. I think that you have a responsibility here that is enormous. And I think that you do what is best for the town, what you see is best for the town. I wonder how much work, how much commitment has been made, how consciously these decisions have been made around this facility. I think there's, there's a lot of members of our community who didn't know about it. And I think when they learn about it, I don't often find people shrugging it off. That's what I have to say about this. I really appreciate your time. Of course, I care a lot about it. I respect the work that you do and thank you for the work that you do. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be with you tonight and to anyone who took the time to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Warren. Next is Representative Chiazzo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I will try and be uh, brief. Um, Having uh, served on the council previously, I know the difficult position you, you, you folks are in. Um, I don't envy you with a position. It's oftentimes you feel like you're between a rock and a hard place and, and powerless. Um, so I, 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 I hope I don't have any unrealistic expectations of, of the group, and I hope you don't feel like I'm, I'm trying to impose any unrealistic expectations on you. Um, Maine is, of course, as Representative Warren mentioned, you know, we're, we're a home rule and independent state. They're cornerstones of Maine. Uh, that's how we choose to govern. Um, we are um, a, a very, um, uh, very spirited group, um, and you know, as a leader and as a as a, an elected official for West Scarborough, uh, I'm I'm not prepared yet to accept that the ice facility is a done deal. Um, I think there are still uh, avenues and venues that we can take, certainly from the state and federal level, and as well as the local level. Um, so I, I would, you know, my ask of the council would be that, you know, if you as a body um, 
agree that you don't think this is a good facility or that you that you feel like we we could do better or we should do better um, there are other ways to support our efforts um, whether it's um, you, you know um, uh, putting forth re non-binding resolutions or something supporting a position. Um, it could be testimony in Augusta. Uh, Representative Warren, myself, and several other legislators are working on some some bill, uh, a bill, to, to hopefully put in front of the state. Testimony from this group would be very influential and very important in, in something like that, both as individuals and certainly collectively as a council. Uh, and I would also, you know, uh, hope that if you do feel strongly about the facility and the, but not necessarily the the purposes of the facility, but the way in which the facility was brought to the town and the manner in which it was presented. Um, if you have concerns about that, I would urge you to please collectively and jointly reach out to the federal representatives and express that opinion. And again, these can all be done without passing ordinances and laws. They're non-binding resolutions. And, and certainly I fully understand anything like that that comes out of this body needs unanimous consent. So, um, you know, sometimes that's, that's a lot more difficult to do than than it sounds. So um, I, I would appreciate, you know, um, some support on that effort. We're going to continue trying to fight this in Augusta for sure. We're going to continue to work with our federal constituents, our, our federal colleagues. Certainly want to keep working with you folks as well, because I think the, the, the more united and stronger our voices are, the better our chances are of positive outcomes for everybody. So, so thank you for your time. And thank you so much for what you guys are doing. I, I know it's, uh, it's not easy and uh, you don't get enough kudos and credit where, where it deserves. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gazzo. Up next is Kelly Merrill. Hi, my name is Kelly Merrill. I live at 101 West Front Street in Skowhegan, Maine. Um, thank you, John and Katerina, for your work on this matter. And thank you, Representatives Warren and Gazzo, for your testimonies. As a journalist, I write about hot button issues, and some of those stories need to be painted with a lot of facts and figures. But what we're talking about condoning in Scarborough is simply an institution of extreme cruelty, violence, and hatred. It is morally repugnant, and we must find creative ways to resist its presence here. We need to resist it at the city and state levels because we cannot wait for the federal government we can't count on the federal government to grow conscience. A change of heart with a different administration is not something we should be banking on. This kind of violence is nothing new and our neighbors are fearful for their lives now. We need to make it impossible to establish and operate an immigration and customs enforcement facility here in Scarborough. We need to find a way I don't want us to have any part of helping this institution, which has systematically caged children, been responsible for forced hysterectomies, ripped apart families, and created conditions that have been especially horrific for women and girls. Now, though you've said that local law enforcement doesn't currently intend to cooperate with ICE, now that ICE is here, that will necessarily change because ICE needs our cooperation, or at least for us to be complicit which is what this body would effectively do in expecting the state and federal levers, levels to have the sole responsibility for remedy, remedying this problem. These are agents of terror for our community and we should ensure that they are not welcome here. When you want to talk, there are many activists who would like to help stop this agency and its presence in Scarborough. I encourage you to contact us at deicemaine at gmail.com. I uh, thank you for your time and for your work on this. Thank you, Ms. Mer Merrill, excuse me. There are no more hands raised, but I will pause for just a second. If there's anybody else in the audience that would like to speak. Ms. Woodbury, you are going to be next. And Ms. Woodbury, you have an older version of Zoom, so you're going to come in with your camera off on. I'm going to ask you to turn your camera off, please. You're going to come in with your camera on, and I'm going to ask you to turn it off. Hello. Thank you. Yep, you're all set. Um, thank you. Um, I. I'm also speaking against the ICE facility, um, encouraged to hear um, 
so many voices speaking some of the same concerns that I have and hold. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to add, I guess, I think that, um, you know, in, in Congressional District 1 here in Maine, um, with Shelley Pingree as our representative in Washington, um, you know, I think it is important to reach out to our, our national level representatives. Um, and I, I don't think that Shelley Pingree condoned, um, you know, forced sterilizations and facilities, forced feedings and facility separation of families, caging of children, people being sprayed with poison bug spray, um, in act like not being able to access food and water, being kept in extremely cold temperatures, um, like just all of the horrors and lack of sanitation and just lack of humanity and dignity in these facilities. We know that ICE um, operations are, are kind of behind closed doors and, and people there are doing whatever they want. Um, I worked closely with a friend who is a lawyer and went to facilities um, to represent people at their hearings and what she saw. Um, I just can't even describe <laughs> even secondhand. It's just horrifying. Um, the news that comes out of those facilities doesn't surprise her at all because it's so commonplace in, in the facilities that she has seen. And we don't need that here. We don't need our families and, and our neighbors um, living in fear of that here in Maine. And the, the officers that are doing that may live here, um, but I, I just, I don't think that we need to make it comfortable for people to have jobs where they can go behind closed doors and do whatever they want to vulnerable people. And we know that that's what they do again and again and again. And this is not just an issue um, that impacts the southern border. We know that a father was recently detained, um, removed from his family here in Maine only a few weeks ago. Um, I don't think that we can wait for Joe Biden and national government to um, to stop this. You know, this has been gone, going on for a long time in this country, but we can certainly do everything that we can to stop this from happening in our own communities. And I don't think I mentioned previously, I live in Westbrook. I'm at 24 Green Street. So um, not in Scarborough, but I am right next door. And things that are happening in Scarborough are definitely impacting things in all of the surrounding communities um, and the state generally. We know that there are employers in Scarborough as well as other communities in Southern Maine and greater Portland area um, that are employing people um, that ICE is targeting. And uh, it's just, it's, it's not acceptable. This needs to stop. We need to make sure that, that people that are here, raising their families here, working here, there are neighbors, there are coworkers, there are friends, there are family members. We need to make sure that they're safe and do everything that we can and risk everything that we're able to to make sure that they have that opportunity here. Thank you, Maria. It's a little bit difficult putting you back in the audience because I had to promote you. So if you get booted, it was not intentional. <laughs> Thanks. I have, I have five hands raised and I'm going to limit it to the next five. So if you, I'm going to treat this like in line at town hall. So Ms. Brenner, you're going to be the last speaker. Um, with that, uh, Luis, you are up. Uh... Hello, my name is Luis Segredel. I am a registered voter of Scarborough at Three Dollars Way. And I'd like to echo what others have said about not wanting an agency like ICE based on hate and prejudice uh, in my town. Uh, I want to echo my neighbors and students from the Scarborough Anti-Racism Coalition, um, some of whom reached out to you about their concerns, and I stand in support with them and those concerns. Uh, thank you for the space for having this conversation, and I respectfully ask of you to be proactive in working with our elected officials at the state and national level to explore our options for stopping this facility. 
and to also be proactive in thinking about the future, such as the points that uh, Councilman Anderson brought up. What are things we can do moving forward so that Scarborough is, is truly a welcoming and safe place for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Dunn, you are up next. Thank you uh, for having me and for having everyone tonight. This is such an important topic. Um, my name is Mary Dunn. I live in Whitefield. And uh, thank you for allowing us to share our comments. I realize I don't live in Scarborough, but this is certainly um, an issue that's going to affect everyone in our state. So the entire state the entire state is watching what's happening in Scarborough right now. Um, I look at the work that's being done tonight as the beginning of our work. Um, it, it looks like the ICE facility is, you know, doing everything it can to come into your town. And uh, as others before me stated, that means our work is really just beginning. I would like to reiterate what some people ahead of me so eloquently said. ICE is not a good neighbor. Scarborough does not want ICE in their neighborhood. It's not a good neighbor for Maine. They cause incredible harm. Like others, I've worked with people that have gone through ICE facilities and ICE detention, and their stories are incredibly alarming and sad. Um, this facility is one of the beginning stages of ICE detain, detention, and deportation pipeline. Again, this is not good for Scarborough. This is not what Scarborough wants to be recognized for and known for. Taking people into ICE custody causes incredible harm. The ICE processing facility will cause fear among our hardworking immigrant communities. It causes family separation. We will no longer be able to say family separation is not happening because it will be. It causes loss of income to hardworking families. It causes unnecessary trauma to families and children. It sends a horrible message about who we are as a town and who we are as a state. This already happens in our town, in our state, and Scarborough should do all it can to make sure it, it doesn't become part of this. Again, the ICE processing facility sends the wrong message to all our citizens. We should be helping our undocumented neighbors uh, obtain citizenship, not causing them to live in yet more fear. Many are living in fear. Um, over this. They have already survived the horrors of whatever caused them to come into our country and come to the state of Maine. We should be greeting them. We should not be causing them to live this way. Um, again, ICE is a horrible institution. Uh, those who work for ICE, we could try to let them off the hook and say they're just doing their jobs. Uh, I don't agree with that assessment of it at all, because when your job entails that you um, cause harm and fear to others, then that job needs to be looked at. As others mentioned, widespread abuses have been reported by ICE. Our current government, our president, is even having a hard time reining them in um, with how they are operating. So the culture of this, this ICE has not been addressed and will be difficult to address. So I hope Scarborough does everything it possibly can to keep this facility out of their town. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Dunn. Yep. I think, uh, Ms. Rowan, you are next. There are four people left. Uh, Lynn, you will be the last person. You did you did put your hand up while I was talking last time. So um, Lynn will be the last person. Ms. Rowan, you are up. And Aaron, same thing with you. Your camera will be on. I was proactive this time and covered it with a post-it. No. <laughs> um, so I've been listening so attentively that I haven't had time to organize my own thoughts. Um, so I apologize if I ramble. First of all, thank you for having this conversation tonight. I think I'm one of the people who's been emailing you for months and asking for this. Um, I'd like to, to correct something that Councillor Glastein said um, regarding this conversation was planned and was going to happen 
even without all of the emails. That's actually not true, according to the information that, that I have uh, received from other members of the council. Um, so I would like to thank everyone who's listening who stepped up and um, pushed for this to happen because it was something that required community pressure um, in order for the council to engage in this conversation tonight. Um, also, I really liked a lot of what um, I heard. I was kind of feeling like pretty hopeless. Um, I've been following this issue since last year when it first appeared in the Bangor Daily News. And I've been really disappointed with the lack of concern about it um, in, the, in Scarborough and the broader community. Uh, anytime I mentioned it to someone, they've never heard of it before. I and also ISIS because a lot of... Oh, Kerrigan's going to say something too. Because like our people in this country right now, is being like really honest, but like somebody in this beautiful country that did something for us and for a lot of like immigrants, we need to know what is in Donald Trump that's making us feel like they put a lot of commercial to this community. And what my mom's doing right now, they're even more important and let the public need to say something and be brave and be strong. A lot of children in this world need to feel like you put yourself out there and prove Donald Trump that you are a citizen and you never make Donald Trump feel bad for himself. But you gotta be strong to believe in. And do you think that, do you like having ice in Scarborough, Kerrigan? I don't like ice because all our people, treat like all our people very badly. I don't want to see Donald Trump do this in this country. But we have a new president. We still have this ISIS in our country. And we get this thing out. And what does ice do to children at the border? Separate children. From from the parents. Is that okay? Absolutely not okay. I agree. Um, so Kerrigan is a 13-year-old student in seventh grade at Scarborough Middle School. Um, and I think she <laughs> said that pretty well. Um, she actually, her first protest that she ever attended was um, in opposition to ICE um, family separation, uh, which... Uh, had a big impact on her so and obviously she's not a big fan of our former president and she's hopeful that that our current administration will make some changes um, but in the meantime I think there's a lot that can happen at the local level uh, I liked what um, representative Chiazzo said I'm curious if if it's accurate to say there's nothing the town can do um, and if, if it's actually, it would be really expensive for the town to do something to push back against this. So I'd love more information about that. Um, I really liked what Councillor Anderson um, brought up with Chicago's welcoming city ordinance. I really want to see very specific policies in place in our schools, in our police department, um, and in, in our municipal government um, that actually provide protection to people rather than um, a resolution which you know really doesn't have is is kind of just about worth the paper it's written on um so i was like taking notes while everybody was talking um i also obviously agree with um the idea of having ice in scarborough is just so counter to the resolution, the, the standing against racial and social injustice resolution that the previous council passed very recently. Um, and I know that everybody's working hard to write the, um, working hard on the draft comprehensive plan. And I feel like there could be a place in there um, to make it really clear that we don't want this here. Um, and uh, I would like to see something from the town council, whether it's a, um, a press release um, speaking up against this or a resolution like taking a firm stand against this facility being in Scarborough. I think this is a really important um, issue for, for you all to 
to um, demonstrate leadership on. And I would feel a lot better hearing that from from my elected officials in town. And yes, because I am also a registered Scarborough voter. Um, <laughs> thanks, Kerrigan. Um, I'm sorry, I had like one more thought and it's eight o'clock and it's escaping me. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I just feel like there's so, even um, counselors who, you know, don't mind having ice in Scarborough. I mean, uh, I, I know there are some members of the council who, you know, aren't offended by all the things that ICE does. At least that's my um, impression based on some some um, comments that I've heard in the past. Um, and we also have a Joe Jackson with us. Oh yeah, he, Jackson doesn't get to make public comment though. Um, so, I think, oh, sorry, Kerrigan just totally broke my train of thought. Um, oh, I think ICE owes us some answers, and it doesn't seem like they're willing to give us those answers, so it might be really powerful if the town council drafted something as a council saying, this is happening in our town, we are, we've asked these questions, we're demanding these answers, um, and if that comes with some le legal action to slow this project down, even better. Um, so hopefully, like in later communications, um, you guys will be able to flesh out some of those details too. Thank you, and I apologize for my rambling. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Kerrigan. Uh, same thing, uh, Aaron. I just I oh I can change yep. the role. Here. All right, I have three more, Jillian, Stacy, and then Lynn. Jillian, you are up. And Jillian, you have an old version of Zoom, so your camera's gonna come on, so turn it off. And I'm going to, we're gonna have a hard stop after Lynn. So I have Stacy and Lynn after this. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jillian Trapini Huff, 315 Beach Ridge Road. Um, thank you so much for taking up this, this issue. Uh, tonight. I really appreciate it. I think that this is incredibly disruptive to our community. And while you may not have the power right now, I do think it would go a long way to taking a public stance against this um, being in our town. This is not the legacy that I want Scarborough to have. And so, you know, whatever you can do would be something and uh, certainly better than nothing. Thank you. Thanks, Jillian. And Senator Brenner, you are up next. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you all so much for your service. Um, and thank you for taking up this issue publicly. Uh, I am also joined by Senator Carney tonight. So you almost have your full delegation. I think the, I'm not sure if um, Representative Bailey's here, but we were all excited to come and listen to uh, testimony from the public and then also hear what you all have to say. Um, we've all been asking lots of questions at the state level and I suspect like lots of you, we have more questions than we have answers. Um, one item that I did Glean from watching the planning board meeting was that this building would not be for overnight stays, so not a detention center, but just a daily processing facility. But I still feel like I'm uncertain as to exactly what that means. Um, and I do look forward, along with the rest of the delegation from the state, um, in potentially collaborating on more conversations and a greater understanding of exactly what's going to be happening in this facility. Um, and I'm here to support you and at the state level in this work. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for coming. And Lynn, you were the last one this evening. You are, you come in on mute, so you might need to unmute your microphone.
when you are in, I'm sure you can probably hear us and you're probably trying to figure this out. Lynn, I'm going to bring you in as a panelist and you're going to just turn your, you want to turn your camera off. So you're going to come in with your camera on, see if this works. Any luck? Okay, with that. I am going without objection. I'm going to, first of all, before I say that, uh, thank you everybody for coming. Very, uh, the input was fantastic. Councilor Anderson, thank you very much for doing uh, the initial work on this. Um, I'm glad everybody had the opportunity to speak on this. It was very insightful and we appreciate everybody taking the time. Um, if, we, if there's no objections, I'm going to call a recess until 825, at which we will come back and do some town business. Uh, Councilor Gleistein. Hey, Paul. Yeah, just really quick on the timeline. Uh, Ms. Rowan uh, mentioned, you know, so uh, we were notified February 10th, and I assume this was already in the works ahead of time that we were going to have this public discussion. You know, the bulk of the emails started rolling in around February 12th. So we've had concerned citizens all along the way. And so we were responding to concerned citizens all along the way since this first came out. I think Cater uh, um, Councilor Katarina did a good job at laying out the timeline of how long this has been going on. So, um, uh, so I'm not quite sure where Ms. Rowan got her information, but you know, before the, the, the bulk of the emails came in that were um, constructed you know, with uh, some common information, um, the, uh, this was already planned. So um, I guess I just stand by, stand by what I said and I'm glad we did it. Yeah, well, I, can, I, can, I, I can just address where, where I think that's coming from. So I think originally this, I had proposed this to be a non-action item and then I withdrew that request to make it um, just something that I would bring up in my counselor comments. And I think it was because of the emails we started to get that I reconsidered and you know, decided it would probably be better to have it as a non-action item so that we could actually you know, not save it to the end of the meeting, but have it more upfront so that we could also hear from the public and, and not have them wait the whole time. So that was that was partly my 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 doing from going back and forth with how I wanted it to how I wanted to propose it, propose that it would be on the agenda tonight. Okay, with that, I'm going to, um, I'm gonna call a recess to 828. So we're going to take a seven minute break.
Excuse me, sorry. Okay, before we get started, I just wanted to say if you were in, if you feel like you did not get the opportunity to talk, I believe I let everybody in that raised their hand. Um, but I knew I had, I think, two glitches with anybody. Please email us. We do read, we do all read every email that comes in. So if you felt like you had something to say or, and you couldn't or you just didn't want to for whatever reason, our inbox can be reached at towncouncil at scarboromain.org. And like I said, I think I can confidently say all seven of us would absolutely read your email. Um, give Betsy about 30 seconds. It's 829. I believe I said 828, correct? I'll just give her a couple seconds. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I will uh, call this meeting back to order. We are now on to order number 20087, which is the second reading of the proposed amendments to chapter 405, which is the Scarborough Zoning Ordinance. Section 28B, Highgus Parkway District. Uh, before we get started, I do want to say um, this is second reading and our final action. So we will need somebody to essentially offer an amendment. There's been a lot of wholesale changes here with the input from long range planning and the input from the planning board. Um, so I guess I would ask everybody once Jay presents it, we're comfortable about what we're talking about. I would like somebody to offer an amendment that essentially takes all of those planning board um, suggestions that Jay has incorporated and offered as one large amendment. Toadie, is that okay to do it that way? Is that? Yeah, okay. So just as a heads up, we do need to amend it to make it reflect all the changes it's gone under because of the process. Um, so with that, Tom, do you want to lead it off or should I bring Jay in or? Yeah, I think Jay's best to probably right. tee it up. Uh, this, this has certainly been through the ringer. Uh, this has had more discussion among council and all your advisory boards than most. So uh, yep. we think we're coming back to you with a, a much improved document and hopefully meet your needs. Thank you. Uh, Jay, you are a panelist, so we will see you and hear you. Yep. Or we can just see you if that's <laughs> <laughs> I didn't check my hair first. <laughs> he's, no, he's no Liam Gallagher, but he'll do, right? <laughs> Ouch. Don't let Liam hear that one. Yeah, <laughs> Jay, I prefer your style anyways. It's fine. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> All right, go ahead. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so, yeah, let's see. Uh, I was before you, I think it was just about two weeks ago when we had public hearing. Um, and so I'll, I'll give it, again, another brief overview. Um, this was, or it started as a property owner, or property owner initiated zoning request. And at the, at the initial outset, it was a very simple, almost one line request to allow for drive through restaurants in the Highgus Parkway. Um, and so that, that discussion began uh, back in September of 2020. Um, council actually had your first reading um, shortly thereafter, either September or October. Um, but council members had a, a number of questions at that time. Um, and referred that, um, but did refer the item forward through first reading and it did go to plan and board. And the plan board echoed a lot of the same questions that council had among some others um, as they get into, you know, more site plan review issues than, than council do. And so they had a lot of questions and, and out of their first public hearing, they actually asked the long range planning board, uh, sorry, committee to weigh in on those issues. Um, and, so that, that occurred and really the, the genesis of the sort of amendments that were just talked about came out of that discussion, that second discussion with Long Range Planning Committee about the issues again and questions that were raised by Planning Board and Council. Uh, planning Board held the second public hearing, uh, made some, uh, um, a few tweaks as they looked at the language um, and 
So that's really the the language that is being um, brought forward with a recommendation by planning board are the, the host of changes that I see have just been, um, have been brought up on the screen. And really, so there, there's a couple of different things going on, but the, the, the real crux of the changes, the policy issues are really found in section 2B6, which is I think page nine of the document, which is really some of the performance standards that get at the issue of really what is meant by a mixed use building, um, it really refines where the use can be located within the Highgate Parkway, um, the size of the parcel on which uh, the use can be located, and gets to uh, addressing queuing issues, or this would be stacking, vehicle stacking issues on site to reduce any potential conflicts in the public way. Um, and so those are really the substantive changes. Then as we, working with the Long Range Planning Committee, get deeper into the ordinance, there's opportunity then to really take a look at sort of bringing some of the other provisions um, more in line with some of the uh, more modern or more recently updated zones so that zoning districts read similarly. Um, and then of course we had to do uh, reference changes and, and, and those very um, sort of diminished administrative changes. Um, but what I see on the screen are really the, the, the crux, if you will, of the, of the policy amendment, in addition to, of course, the allowed use. Um, I think, you know, that's what I have for an overview at this point. Like I said, about two weeks ago, we went through this, so I'm happy to answer any questions. And I believe the, um, I did talk with the applicant's uh, representative, and I believe they were gonna be online as well if questions were needed of them. Okay, great. So before I put it on the floor, we'll do counselor questions to Jay and or the applicant. Uh, and then, like I said, before we even, I would like to amend this before we take the vote, just to make it simple. Uh, counselor Hamill? Yeah, I wanted to make a quick comment uh, and then a quick question for Jay. Um, the comment is, I, this is a much better, much better shape than when we saw it the first time. You know, this came flying over the transom and we really didn't know what to do with it. And we were you know, in rare form, you know, placed in a position of act, really operating, acting without a license, practicing without a license. So I'm thank you for saving us from ourselves, Jay. Um, the, the same, same to the, to the planning board. Uh, so I think this makes a lot of sense. I, I think it's uh, uh, it, it's got uh, limitations on it. It's very specific. Uh, you've had input from others as well, including the developer. Um, so I, you know, I think this is uh, in good shape. I did have one question. This, these are changes for the highest Parkway district. So what's the implication for other zoning districts? Uh, at this point, there would be none. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, easy enough. Any more questions for Jay? Uh, Councilor Anderson? <laughs> Yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to understand. So like to Don's point, like there's some very clear restrictions that have been put in the language. So what does that what does that actually mean? Like how many how many restaurants, like worst case scenario, would this actually mean would exist in that particular district? Yeah, we looked at that, I believe it was in in Jean Marie or Don, correct me. I, I think it was either with the long range planning, or it could have been during the planning board. Uh, so forgive me um, if it was with planning board. So yes, one of the limitations just so, you know, uh, for clarity is that the, the restaurant be located within 1250 feet of the intersection of the Higgis Parkway and Payne Road intersection. That's actually a, a distance and language borrowed from the B3 um, uh, for a particular use in the B3. Um, and so, given that we already sort of had that distance in measurement, we figured that would be a good one to use. And this is actually one of those areas that was tweaked through the planning board process. Um, originally in the language coming out of long range planning sort of talked about the parcel being within the 1250 feet, but the planning board felt it would be, um, uh, we, when we looked at that, and now that I'm speaking through it, um, I do recall it was at the planning board workshop. As we looked at it, it, it sort of clipped the very edge of a few properties and they thought, well, that might be expanding further really than we mean to. And so that's where this notion of having it within the, the, the whole um, building within that 1250 feet. And I believe when we looked at it, um, forgive me, but offhand as I recall, it was some, I don't believe it was any more than six or eight 
parcels at the very most um, that could be impacted. Um, but I'm, I don't have it, but that, that's my recollection of the discussion, Mr. Anderson. Uh, you are correct on that, Mr. Chase, because I remember the discussion in, in long range planning and then it went to planning board and they tweaked it a bit because we were trying to make it as narrow as possible. The fear was we didn't want this going down Haggis Parkway. So pretty, it pretty much keeps it right there in that intersection, so. Any more questions for Jay? Okay, so I'm gonna ask for a motion to put on the floor and then I'm gonna ask for an amendment to make it easy here. So uh, do I have a motion? So moved. And do I have a second? Second. And I'm not gonna allow discussion because I think it makes sense to do the amendment now. So is there a motion to amend? I mean, I'll move to amend, but what do I have to read? Do I, have I think to read we can just say in? the wholesale language as provided by Jay. You just heard what he said, ditto. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and is there a second? A second. And we're going to discuss the amendment only. Any discussion on the amendment only? Okay, so we're going to vote as the amendment only. Uh, Tody? Councillor Clucci? Yes. Councillor Gleistein? Yes. Councillor Anderson? Yes. Councillor Katarina? Yes. Councillor Johnson? Yes. Councillor Hamill? Yes. And Chairman Johnson? Yes. Thank you, that's unanimous. Thank you. And now we're back to our back. motion as amended. Or is there any discussion? Seeing none. Oh, oh, Council Coochie. <laughs> uh, I just want to say nice work working this through the process. I, you know, reading through the minutes of the different committees and stuff, I think you got to an endpoint that um, makes sense and I can get behind. And uh, I, I'm sure it wasn't pleasant or the, the, the whole time through. So I want to thank Jay and um, long range planning, Don and Jean Marie and the planning board for helping us come up with a product that I, I, I think is supportable. Thank you. Any others? I have, I have a couple of quick things. Um, oh, geez, I forgot Jason's last name, but um, Jason, whose daughter goes to school with my daughter, uh, owns Perks Beverage Company in uh, Cabela's Plaza. And it's funny, I stopped in there a couple of days ago, uh, a couple months ago, and, you know, they sell beer. And he was mentioning how um, the beacon in that area has made a huge difference in his business, you know, and I think sometimes we forget we forget that there's parts of what we do helps the economy of the town, right? We talk about growth a lot. We talk about a lot of things, but, you know, Councillor Cucci does this probably more than any of us. We also want to create a robust economy for individual business owners that are also residents of this town. And Jason, I apologize. I know you're in Sedco and everything. And I can't remember your last name. Um, but it just struck me that this is just adding to that side of town with the economy, right? And um, that's 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 not a bad thing. Um, my second thing is compliment Jay. I think, you know, I Don said it perfect. I think in the beginning we were on our heels and I think this process played out perfectly. And, um, and then my last compliment is to Mr. Hamill because I think as leadership, we had a choice between it going to planning board and then directly back to us. But we said, no, please run it through absolutely everything. And Jay, you were gracious enough to do so. So I, I appreciate that because I think we ended in a much better spot. So. And Paul, for the record, I believe it's Jason Perkins. Hence Thank you. Perkins. <laughs> Hence the Perks name, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Very nice guy and great beer. So <laughs> um, with that, uh, Tony, you want to take a vote? Councilor Clucci? Yes. Councilor Gleistein? Yes. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. And Chairman Johnson? Yes. The votes are unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, order number 21006 is a second reading on the proposed amendments to chapter 302, the town council rules and policy, subsection 203.0D, three members to rules and policy committee. Uh, Betsy, do you want to let us know what this is? Or refresh, I should say? Sure. Um, this is just a, uh, a sort of a housekeeping matter we took up um, to tweak the uh, section 2030D3 um, members to the rule, rules um, and policy committee and what the rules and policy committee um, specifically would look at within rules and policy. So I'll just read um, this as changed, which is the rules and policies committee shall review existing and proposed 
Town Council Adopted Policies, Chapter 101, Rules and Procedures, Chapter 302, and Committee and Board Rules and Procedures, Chapter 302A, for consistency, relevance, and clarity, and ensure all are in compliance with state law and the local town charter. All recommendations will be brought forward for approval by the town council. And I'm going to take that as the motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Okay, Tody? Councilor Cucci? Yes. Councilor Gleistein? Yes. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. And Chairman Johnson? Yes. Thank you. That's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, next is order number 21014, act on the request to approve the names posted to various committees and board as are recommended by the Appointments and Negotiation Committee on February 3rd, 2021. So we'll have Don, um, Councilor Hamill explain it and put it on the floor. Councilor Hamill. Thank you. Uh, yes, this is uh, moving through the, the wave of appointments that typically happen at the beginning of, of the new year following uh, November elections. Uh, so we're very pleased that uh, uh, we basically filled all full voting member posts, and I think the only ones remaining are a handful of uh, alternates. So really outstanding work by the Appointments and Negotiations Committee, uh, Betsy Gleistein and Ken Johnson and Toady. You know, Toady and Tom and staff have really uh, worked full bore on this and have moved with great dispatch. So th thanks to everyone. So with that, I'm going to read, this is a short list tonight, uh, Board of Assessment Review appoint Freyla Tarpinian as a full voting member with a term to expire 2023, and Charles Kanazak as full voting member to filling a term to expire 2021. Coastal Waters and Harbor Committee move Kevin Ferry to full voting member with a term to expire 2023 and appoint Andrew Fortunato as first alternate to fill a term to expire 2021. Community Services and Recreation Advisory Board appoint Jean Ginn Marvin as second alternate to fill a term to expire in 2021. Conservation Commission appoint Randy Hogan, full voting member with a term to expire 2023 and Noah Perlett, full voting member with a term to expire 2022. Long Range Planning Committee appointing Rachel Erickson, Rachel Hendrickson as planning board liaison as a non-voting member term to expire 2022. Parks and Conservation Land Board appoint Noah Perlett as full voting member, term to expire 2021. Personnel Appeals Board appoint Charles Kanazak as second alternate with term to expire 2023. And Senior Advisory Board appoint Elise Bolda, second alternate, term to expire 2021. Thank you. And is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Councilor Cucci and then Councilor Caterina. Yeah, I just wanted to commend the work of the uh, of Tody and the Appointments Committee. Um, I've had a couple of uh, appointees reach out to me, and I've just been blown away with um, the quality and caliber of, of people that are stepping up to volunteer for, for the town. So um, it's encouraging to me, and thank you. Uh, yeah, and I, I'm just going to say ditto to that. I know having served on ANC before, it's a lot of work. Um, and I think, you know, it's not just ANC. Uh, also, I'll give communications some credit here, too, um, for making sure we, it's very easy now to sign up. You don't have to fill out a paper form and bring it in to Toady. You can do something online. Uh, and, I, and um, you know, by putting it out on the quarter, uh, excuse me, on the monthly emails and, and whatnot, I think we've really gotten people involved. So kudos. Thank you. Councilor Gleistein? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely um, want to reiterate that and uh, just to say that um, the website is uh, really got uh, easy to find information now. Um, and I know we're kind of after a long meeting, so I don't know how many people are mentioning, but on the homepage, if you go to agendas and minutes, you can see a whole lot of things about all of the committees and you can find minutes and video streams um, for the ad hoc committees and everything else. If you've kind of been digging around, try to, trying to find things, um, definitely go to that link. It's a big button on the homepage, agenda and minutes. 
Hold on, keep talking, Betsy, so I can pull it up for you. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> I can't see because I went to another screen. So. Oh, okay, but it's right here. It's right on the home screen. So if you're watching, it's right there. So she's referencing. Yep, it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, great. Any others? Okay, Tony. Councilor Cucci. Yes. Councilor Gleistein. Yes. Councilor Anderson. Yes. Councilor Katarina. Yes. Councilor Johnson. Yes. Councilor Hamill. Yes. And Chairman Johnson. Yes. Thank you. That's unanimous. Okay, we're on to new business now, which is order number 21015. It's an act on the request pursuant to Title 23 MRSA 33025 and the requirements of Section 4 of the Scarborough Street Acceptance Ordinance to approve the streets as noted in the recommended by the town engineer. We've done a, a chunk of these recently, so I think with that, I'm just going to ask for a motion. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? Tony? Councilor Cucci? Yes. Councilor Gleistein? Yes. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Katarina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. And Chairman Johnson? Yes. That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item number 10 is standing a special committee, uh, committee reports and liaison reports. Please raise your hand if you have anything to offer. Councilor Katarina? Yeah, uh, tomorrow is ordinance at four o'clock. It's a pretty brief uh, agenda. The first thing we're going to talk about is fireworks. We've had a number of constituents over the last year want to do something about fireworks. So I'm bringing forward an option to ban all consumer fireworks. Uh, in the town of Scarborough, and we'll see how it goes. The second portion of that will be that the three members of the ordinance committee are gonna discuss a presentation by uh, Chair Johnson and Mr. Cloutier regarding some thoughts and ideas around the growth management plan, growth management ordinance, excuse me. Um, so that will be tomorrow at four. So tune in as always, um, we'll take uh, comments. I take the comments from the public at the beginning of the meeting. I limit it to about 10 minutes uh, total, and then we go into our business. Uh, and I think that's it for me. Thank you. I know I said this in the chair's report, but Clucci, Councilor Clucci and I will not be there to make the presentation. Right. We don't need five of us at a committee. So, uh, Councilor Clucci? <laughs> I appreciate that, actually. Yeah, all um, right. <laughs> just an update on uh, finance work. We, uh, we did uh, approve our um, first reading budget goals or targets uh, earlier today, actually, before we, got, we started meeting. And... Uh, you know, highlights it was basically guidance to, uh, you know, don't go crazy, come in lean. But um, we also want to understand what it might take to restore some of the cuts that were made last year to to arrive at the budget that we arrived at last year, which was a, um, a year of pretty great uncertainty as we were going through the budget. Um, so it was good that we were able to collaborate uh, with both the Board of Education and amongst uh, the committee to come up with uh, some targets that we could get behind. Um, the next meeting is going to be next Wednesday at four and the top of the agenda is going to be reviewing the senior housing uh, proposal for the former public safety um, building site. Uh, we've, <clears throat> I, I think, uh, come up with some good questions uh, to uh, hopefully put that project in a little greater context. I view this as we're, we're uh, evolving in our ability to evaluate CEAs and I think this is going to be an opportunity for us to, uh, to refine our uh, approach and uh, mechanics. Um, we're also uh, kind of standing agenda items for the finance committee this year is going to be talking about long-term planning and financial reporting. Um, and I, I think the committee's going to hopefully, as we progress through the year, come out with some uh, some ideas and uh, ways for us to improve in those, those areas. And we're also going to talk about budget outreach, um, which is something in the uh, Zoom world is, is going to be a little different than it has been in the past. So. Um, for the downtown subcommittee or downtown committee, uh, John, I'll start, but please fill in the gaps. I, I guess my, my sense right now is uh, they're, they're coalescing. So they're starting, they're really having some good conversations. We've got some great, great members there. Uh, they're breaking the work down into to smaller chunks. There is, I, I think, a, a bit of stress about the timeline 
And uh, I'd like to be able to signal that, uh, from my perspective anyway, uh, for the downtown committee, we gave guidance in terms of the timeline. And um, it's not a hard uh, deadline from my perspective. Uh, if, if counselors, so I guess where, where I'm going with that is I just want to signal to you that uh, we may need to, to relax some of the expectations in terms of uh, the, the deliverable, because as they break it down into chunks, it, it, it seems like a lot to tackle in the span of a couple of months. Um, and that's it. Thank you, sir. Any others? Councillor uh, Johnson and then Councillor Geistein. Yeah. Sorry, I, I was really enthused about this, but it's been a long day. So I just wanted to give the town council a heads up. Going to work with the chair to bring uh, in the not too distant future a non-action item to the full council for a discussion on a community survey. The communication committee has had a good discussion. We feel that we've had three community type surveys over a 30 year period. Last one done in 2010, which was uh, basically a, uh, a service satisfaction with our, with our town services, you know, EMS and whatnot, which, which was fine. But prior to that uh, was 1990 and 1999 that uh, also included uh, service satisfaction, but also land use growth, uh, lots of other interesting topics that we think maybe it's, and they did it over a 10 year period using the same questions. So we got some good trend analysis that actually fed into an awful lot of policy decisions out of the 2000 uh, growth and services report was the uh, GMO, which was about six months after that report. Plus a lot of fed into our comp plan on zoning. So a lot of good came out of that. We so we figured it's time. We want to have a general discussion with uh, with the town council. We do have some money allocated for this. It might not be enough, but we can we'll we'll address that when we get there. We did agree as a committee. Again, everything open for discussion. That we'd like to have this administrated by a third party, nothing homegrown. Get the experts that know what they're doing. Uh, so we need from the council to collect what we want to know. Then we'll have some discussions with some vendors about what they can give us. And again, we'll just let the process flesh out. So it was a heads up before the uh, non-action item, I'll try to send out to everybody uh, some sampling of what we've done in the past, just to spark some creative thoughts about what, uh, what we might wanna see in the future. And I'll tell you, today was a great example of, we need to know certain things. We need to know what people think, what people want. So uh, we think it's time. Thank you, that's it. Thank you, sir. Councilor Gleistein and then Councilor Hamill. Uh, yeah, the Ad Hoc um, Charter Review Committee meets the second and fourth, um, the full committee meets the second and fourth uh, Thursdays. And um, the, the same link that we showed earlier in the meeting, um, you just go to Ad Hoc Charter Review Committee and you can see the, um, the video streams. Um, we have a tracker um, that Liam has uh, worked really hard on as well as some other committee members. So um, every single um, proposed change that's been made by anyone on the committee or anyone in the community is being tracked um, and kind of categorized. Um, I don't see that posted on ad hoc charter review committee website yet or on their web page but um, I think there is discussion that that will be posted um, if you if you have an interest in that and you want to see it you know I'm happy to share it um, we also have minutes I don't um, and those can be found on that same page um, we've had um, Annalie Rosenblatt who's been doing the minutes and she's quite thorough and doing um, a really good job so obviously the best way is to listen to all the video streams if you want to get a really good sense of what's going on, but there are quite a few of them. Um, so I would definitely encourage people interested in the charter process. Uh, it's a great process, it's ongoing, get involved now, um, attend the meetings, speak up, uh, contact committee members, contact your liaisons um, and track what we're doing. Um, but I'm, I, I think the committee is doing a fabulous job. Thank you, uh, thank you. Councilor Hamill? Yes, I had a couple of updates from Coastal Waters and Harbor Committee, as well as the Shellfish Commission. Um, 
you know, after many months of not meeting, I'm pleased to say uh, because of the staffing efforts as well as uh, really diligent work from Toady and staff, uh, both of those committees are up and running and had good meetings last week. Uh, they're going to be coming forward with some suggestions on how to improve the enforcement of traffic down uh, uh, at the co-op, down, down at the town landing. Um, in the summer, this has been a problem. Last year, we had a problem with enforcement where uh, uh, clamors uh, and other lobster uh, lobstermen uh, were not able to park their vehicles, you know, with trailers uh, because of uh, tourists parking there uh, illegally. So they're going to be coming back with some specific recommendations for how we might improve that this summer to get ahead of it and hopefully in place by an April-May timing. And I, I think the two, the chairs, Nate, Nate Orr is continuing as she, uh, shellfish chair and um, Mike Slavin is do, doing a hell of a job as uh, the new chair for Coastal Waters. So, uh, and Randy Richardson has been helping as well. So we're, you know, very, very pleased that those those committees are back up and running with some new members. And um, I think we're going to be getting a lot done in the next cycle. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Councilor Calarino. Yeah, I'm sorry. I forgot about long range planning. I just wanted to update everyone that we're going great guns on uh, getting the updates to the comprehensive plan done. And I think they're going to be done probably what? on about three meetings probably yeah this this work is like uh root canal <laughs> i tell you it's getting done and the committee is really yeah. um really doing great work the new yeah. members are are contributing and the consensus around issues uh is, is really powerful so jay's doing a very good job yeah. um coordinating this and we're helping him with the laboring or you know he doesn't have to do all the edits himself so yeah, yeah really good Thank you. Any others? No, uh, as far as leadership is concerned, I think I, I sent out a quick chairs report to everybody yesterday, I believe. Nothing too new to report. I did produce a quick video for um, Allison to post on Facebook, on the on the Scarborough Facebook page. So if you're, if you're on social media, there is something of me in six minutes, in six minutes trying to frantically explain everything that's going on in the town, which is probably still four minutes too long, but there is, there is something out there at least uh, trying to give an overview of um, our current hot topic issues or everything we're dealing with. Uh, so with that, are there any councilor member comments? Councilor Katarina. Uh, very, very quickly, I know Tom mentioned the Project Grace uh, fuel assistance fund. In a normal year, I run around just about every town council meeting handing out bags to people in the audience and, and whatnot. Um, I would really challenge, I'm going to put out a challenge to all of you to please contribute. You can go online and contribute to the heat uh, assistance fund. I know I contribute $100 every year. I don't expect you to do that, but it'd be nice if you did. Um, and then the other thing is, um, I did want to give my personal sympathy to Catherine Rancourt and family. That's Carol's daughter. I've known Carol for a, a number of years, um, having worked with her on various committees and, and whatever. Um, and she was like the guru of Medicare at Southern Maine Area Agen uh, Agency on Aging. Um, she was fabulous. She did just so much for the folks there. And she will be missed greatly. So I just wanted to um, say something in my comments tonight. Thank you. Any other counselor comments? I have a few. Um, I think it was either the last meeting or the meeting before. Uh, I, I left the meeting abruptly and some people watching at home heard me say my house is on fire. Uh, so I just wanted to publicly thank the Scarborough Fire Department uh, for coming out and helping me with my house being on fire uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, utmost professional, uh, incredibly kind. One gentleman on my, on my front lawn said, somebody told me you were the chair of the council and I don't care. I'm just doing my job. And I was like, I like you. So, <laughs> uh, so thanks to the Scarborough fire department. Um, secondly, with the, I think in the beginning, when I teed up the ice conversation, I, I referenced that we had over 200 emails and only 15 of them or only 15 of them were Scarborough voters. I want to make it really clear. I fully appreciate this is this, this issue is well beyond our borders as Scarborough. Um, so by no means was I suggesting that this shouldn't be important to anybody in our surrounding communities. And I hope our willingness to have 
anybody speak tonight speaks to the fact that, you know, we're willing to listen to anybody that has an opinion on this. Um, so I just wanted to let everybody know. I, I, I do think it's important to to understand the 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 outcome and the statistics behind what we get for feedback. But I was not trying to diminish any voices that are outside of Scarborough. Uh, thirdly, uh, I just I wanted to, you know, Councillor Johnson, I just wanted to give him credit. I know that some of us know him just as the guy that's against zoning changes, but I think that he's done a tremendous job in this communication committee. I think in this past year, if we look if we look at some of the improvements that have happened, I think a lot of it has to do with a lot of his behind the scene hustle. You know, a lot of people don't know that, you know, the counselors now, we have a dedicated space in the Scarborough Leader and that that's, that is huge. You know, every single edition or tw uh, every other edition, I believe we have, we have the ability to, you know, use our voice to educate the public and that, that goes a long way. Um, secondly, I think the, um, the last thing I would say is I, I, from what I'm, I'm hearing from people is I feel like the comp plan is going in a really positive direction. And that's nice to hear. I think that about three months ago or two months ago, we were all feeling quite overwhelmed and I feel like we have some general positive direction. So I, it's, it's reassuring to hear that everybody's feeling, I think from going from overwhelmed to feeling upbeat that at least we have a light at the end of the tunnel. So I just wanted to acknowledge that publicly that it's nice to have that, that tone change. And when I say tone change, just simply, I feel, feel like we're a little less overwhelmed, which that's when we make our best decisions. So I really appreciate the work. I, you know, I think Jay Chase deserves all the credit in the world. He, he spends ridiculous amounts of time with a lot of us and in different, with different angles and different thoughts and different questions. And I just wanted to thank him. Um, and then actually, lastly, lastly, I wanted to thank Karen Martin at SEDCO. Uh, there's been a couple um, constituent issues that I've been dealing with, with some pretty serious struggles with their own land and trying to get some sewers, uh, some sewer access to their land on an area of town that doesn't have sewer. And, you know, it's not a perfect situation, but I think it's fair to say that Karen put in many, many hours at my request uh, to help find at least a path forward for a couple of our residents. And I think oh, we know her as someone that comes and presents to our council, but I think what's lost is the huge, huge bulk of her job is actually helping the business community in this town and actually helping out individual residents uh, with certain issues. So I just wanted to publicly, you know, acknowledge the work that she does because it's pretty tireless and I don't, I don't think we see it all the time. Uh, so I just wanted to thank her because it, it, it helped tremendously. Uh, so with that, I think I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. And Tony? Councilor Clucci? Yes. Councilor Gleistein? Yes. Councilor Anderson? Yes. Councilor Caterina? Yes. Councilor Johnson? Yes. Councilor Hamill? Yes. Chairman Johnson? Yes.